Metal forged in the 80s. Judas Priest screaming for vengeance. I don't know this record. Tim, do you know this record? I do not. Luckily for us, a listener does, and he wants to tell us why it's his favourite album from 1982. Me and Tim, notoriously ignorant when it comes to metal music. Judas Priest screaming for vengeance. Let's hear the listener's review, please, Mr. Rob. Hi, I'm Mick from Australia. My pick is Judas Priest screaming for vengeance. And at the tender age of 12, it was my first introduction to heavy metal and on cassette. I probably purchased it for the cover art, not knowing anything about the music itself. The dual guitars on the title track give you a hint of what's to come. Rob Halford's vocal range is insane, especially on the title track, and there's even a couple of ballads thrown in. I set it as a benchmark, along with the number of the beast and mob rules in this genre. I'd love to agree with you, except neither of us have heard it, so we can't. I mean, I quite like you. I like their first couple of albums that are underrated, Judas Priest. And I think, you know, British Steel, what an amazing album that was, and Unleashed in the East. So I did, you know, know and okay, buy so some Judas Priest. Yeah. I do, and I actually I agree with him. Um, Holford has got an amazing voice. You know, he's one of the great metal vocalists, and they've got a really good guitar sound. The earlier albums are more tied in with the kind of classic rock metal. It's slightly more free. And while it doesn't fit in with Zeppelin or Sabbath or Purple, you can see there's a kind of a looseness to the band's sound. Whereas by British Steel, it's honed to perfection. And I knew British Steel and I knew Unleashed in the East and I knew the early things like Rock and Roller and so on, but I didn't really follow it through into the 80s. Okay. But at least you know more about Judas Priest than I do, which is very little, I'm afraid. So yeah, shame even Nostradamus, say. their great I'm concept album say. from okay. later on. The listener there also mentioned Iron Maiden's Number of the Beast, which I think is seen, is it, I think it's still seen, fair to say, still seen as the, as the zenith of Maiden, Maiden's catalogue, isn't it? The kind of pinnacle of, of Maiden's catalogue. We've, we've talked yeah. about it before, how we both love, I think we both love the Paul Diano era, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, the Number of the Beast is the beginning of them going into more, I guess more sort of Judas Priest sort of territory, more operatic mm -hmm. vocals with Bruce, Bruce Dings, an amazing vocalist, and the twin guitar sound. There's a lot of that kind of roughness that I associate with the new British wave, the new wave of British heavy metal has begun to sort of disappear from their sound. But a record that did come out this year that is quintessential, that word, sorry, new wave of British heavy metal, one of my favourite metal records, Diamond Head's Borrowed Time. Um, did we talk about the White Album when we did the, 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 the independently produced I'm pretty sure we did because yeah. I saw them, I think I, I said this, that when I was in my mid-teens yeah. at um, one of That's the local right, pubs, yes. yeah. all of the new wave British heavy metal bands played. And I wasn't necessarily, yeah, it wasn't really my music, but I went to see them. So I saw Iron Maiden, you know, Paul Diano lineup, and they were great. Yeah. And I saw Diamond Head, Witch Find, um, White Spirit, all of these bands that were playing week after week. And certainly Diamond Head were one of those bands that cut a dash. They were also really nice because I was very much underage. And a couple of the band members were. I think one of the band members was only my age or a year older. He was like 15 or 16. And they let us in backstage and we were in with them in their dressing room. And I remember talking about um, usually Zeppelin, yes, Rush albums with them. Um, they, they were th very nice guys. They had, they did have that. Maybe that's why I, I kind of like them. Um, of that scene, I particularly like them. They seem to have more of an of a awareness of classic rock in their sound. You could hear Sabbath in Am I Evil. You yeah. could hear Zeppelin in Sucking My Love. You could hear, you know, Deep Purple. You could hear Rush um, in some of the more complex. And there were music fans. It's like, you know, yeah. if I had to come out with who my idol would have probably been then Kate Bush or something, they'd go, yeah. oh, yeah, great. Yeah. They were not right. in any way tainted. Right. And the highlight of the gig was always Am I Evil? And even on the first gig before they were known, before the album was out, you had 350 Warringtonians singing in unison, right. Am I Evil? Yes, I am. It's, a, it's an anthem. It's yeah. an absolute anthem. I mean, I think. And as I always say, the punchline is, and they were. I think Metallica still still cover that song uh, right. occasionally, yeah. Also, Venom's Black Metal came out this year, notable, if nothing else, for being an album that gave name to a whole subgenre of metal, black metal, uh, adopted by some of the Scandinavians, people like Euronymous up in Norway, to basically define a whole scene. Mm. Uh, how many albums can you say that about? So I'm afraid, again, we've been very scanty on metal. OK, Tim, knowing our audience, this is the bit they've all been waiting for. Not all of them. Not all of them. I'm all of them. Some of them have been waiting for us to slag off progressive rock so they can get terribly upset that we don't like their favourite album of all time. That we've given a nine and a half out of ten review. How dare you? They're frothing. They're like that. How dare you not give it ten? Yeah. 
So obviously 1982 is a bit different to 1972 when we were talking about the genre, the very, very peak, mm. uh, very zenith of, of its art. Yeah, It's not true in 1982, is it? I've divided this into t two um, categories. One, which is the kind of old school approach to mm -hmm. progressive rock, and the other side, which is much more prevalent this year, which is kind of embracing pop, trying to adapt to yeah. uh, almost like an analog to what we just talked about with the, the older artists adapting to the new new time. So there's a bunch of progressive rock artists trying to do that too. But first of all, let's talk about the more traditional uh, progressive rock albums. You alluded to previously, Mike Oldfield's Five Miles Out came out this yeah. year, which one side of this record is an old school Mike Oldfield, predominantly instrumental, 25 minute long it epic. Is. And it's good. It is good. It's good. And the other side has uh, a selection of shorter pieces, including some great pop songs. Family Man, the title track. Yeah. Um, so I think this works really well as an album which kind of goes with the times. Yeah. But still retains. It's still very much got one foot in the past, the pr previous decade of traditional progressive rock. And I imagine for that reason, this would have been the comfort blanket for a lot of people at the time well, that still wanted that kind of music as well as the emerging neo-progressive bands, which we'll talk about in a minute. Yeah. But anyway, what's your take no, on this? No, you're right. Yeah. But what's weird is I'd never seen Oldfield really as a traditional progressive rock artist. I always thought his music, to a certain extent, came from classical, came from folk. It was an accidental progressive artist. Yeah, but that's true of all of them, isn't it? We talked about this. All of those bands arrived yeah. at a this similar is, point. Yeah. This is Without almost like a well-produced progressive rock epic. Mm. And it's really good. So, yeah, the first side, 25-minute piece, and it's a decent one in 1982. Second side, as you say, the short pop songs. Didn't Hall & Oates have a hit with Family I Man? I did, yeah. And it's a great song. Yeah. And I really like the title track, which Oldfield sings great. himself. Yeah. One of the rare Oldfield vocal outings. Yes. I mean, Guilty he does, which I love Guilty as well. Yeah. Um, and I love his strangulated voice. And I always liked Five Miles Out, because that was, I think, the first single from it, and I remember seeing it on it's Saturday a duet. morning. It's a duet with Maggie Riley. But okay, yeah, he, he sorry, sings yeah. certain parts of it. Yeah, no, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a very quiet, very very inventive, very creative. Yeah, really quirky little single. Very involved song. Family Man, more a direct song. Mm. This is, I mean, he's working with Maggie Riley, who I think, yeah. you know, obviously famously she sang Moonlight Shadow from the next album, which was a massive international hit. They were a great combination, weren't they? Mm -hmm. Maggie Riley's voice and, and Mike Oldfield's trying to write these, trying to write, succeeding yeah. in writing some very, very yeah, I mean, it's What's great is it, it sounds very 80s and yet it sounds very faithful to traditional progressive rock. And um, also on the second side, there's some instrumental pieces as well. It's not just the pop songs. Tangerine Dream's White Eagle. Tangerine Dream continue their descent or, or move into kind of soundtracky electronic pop but very progressive as well mm. uh, the structures of the pieces the title track of this album is absolutely sublime beautiful track um, just minimalist sequences interlocking sequences some gorgeous harmonic changes but the first side of this much like five miles out is a is a long and i find rather forgettable mm. um 20 minute I like, I, look, I like it. I like this album, and you're right. I think it it kind of comes to a, to a head and a peak on the second side. But what I like about this is that Tangerine Dream, they're 100% faithful to the band that made Phaedra. Yes. But it sounds like a natural early 80s album. You know, this isn't a struggle for them. They're moving with the times without blinking. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I, I really like the second side. There's mm. another track on the second side as well. Uh, I forget the name of it too, which is which is wonderful. Um, the first side is a little bit more forgettable for me, mm. but they're doing what they do. They're, they're keeping faith with their fan base, mm. and this is why I put it in this category. There is the emerging neo-progressive rock scene. Marillion released their first EP this year, which boldly features a 17-minute long pastiche of Genesis mm. on, the, on the B side, um, I mean, all credit to them. They knew it wasn't the most substantial piece of music they had, but they knew it would please the, the prog rock audience. They put it on a B-side. They kind of got it out of the way. Here's this kind of thing that we wrote, you know, the beginning of our career when we were copying Genesis. Let's just put it out. Some of you will like it. Now let's move on and we'll make, mm -hmm. we'll move into the future. And I think that was absolutely the right decision to make because it was something which also cemented their position as being the 
young pretenders to the traditional progressive rock throne. Yeah. Who and else it, would put a 17 minute long epic on the B side of their single? And it became a cult favourite, the whole EP. And for me, I think as we've said before, one of the things that's quite interesting about the Neo Proggers is that there was, like the new wave of British heavy metal, a sort of punk edginess. Yes. In this case, yes. it's the raw performance and Fish's voice. Yes. That's what differentiates it from Supper's Ready. Yes, it has a bit of a DIY thing to it. Yeah. Um, Grendel, the, the track that sets up all the side bit, not great, but has a, an amazing Steve Rothery guitar solo right at the end. But Market Square Heroes, great pop single. Market Square Heroes is a great pop single. And, and Three Boats three Down, down from the Candy is always secretly one of my little favourites of theirs. Now, you mentioned the punk thing going on in the Neo Prog scene. Mm. The album that actually came out this year, rather than an EP, was mm. the 12th Night's Fact and Fiction. Yeah. Now, interesting that I think I may be getting this a bit wrong, but I'm going to tell you what I think I know about this. Twelfth Night actually had been around for a couple of years, mm -hmm. started out more as a traditional sort of instrumental, influenced by people like Gong, had started to move in more of a new wave direction. In fact, their previous album, which only came out with Cassette Smiling at Grief, has got much more in common with stuff like Ultravox. Mm -hmm. And what happened in the interim is Mar they saw Marillion get signed and Marillion break through. And while they were in the middle of making their record Fact and Fiction, they kind of little bit, did a bit, little bit of a backpedal. Mm -hmm. Said, okay, we were going in this direction, but you know what? People are liking this stuff that we were doing a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Let's go back and do a bit of that. And it really works because it captures them at the exact point between these two points. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously they had a very, very strong and very convincing front man at the time as well, Jeff Mann who could go go head to head with Fish, I think. And Fact and Fiction, I think, stands as, well, it's one of the few albums that actually came out during the era because very few of these bands could actually get record deals and therefore get record, get albums actually out on the market. Mm. It stands as one of the most significant albums of the whole neo-progressive early 80s scene, along with, say, the uh, first IQ album and Script for Justice here. Mm -hmm. But it's the one that has a little bit more of that kind of post-punk edge to it. Would you agree with that, Tim? I would, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think we've discussed this with Twelfth Night before. I mean, Jeff Did we? Man, yeah. Oh. Partly when we were discussing IQ and then oh, okay. the differences and the, and the post-punk quality that many of these bands seem to possess. It was odd, wasn't it? As you say, Smiling at Grief has got even more of that kind of intense ultra-vox quality, yeah. the John Fox ultra-vox. Um, well, but also the mid-year, yeah, but yes, yeah, go on. But they did the live at the Target, which was the instrumental Echoplex guitar. Very gongy and Genesis, yes, yeah. That's um, which is good. Um, and I, yeah, I, I quite like them, because as you say, they're this weird but wholly successful hybrid of very intense post-punk, emerging electro-pop but with an edge, yes, and a total acknowledgement of progressive ambition yes. the genesis the van de graaff the pink floyd and conceptual rock yeah and creep, it's all in creep there. show we are saying two um, minute epics um but then like you say the title track is a piece of electro pop all yeah. sense fact and fiction um so yeah very very interesting band it's a shame in a way that they weren't able to continue with with jeff mann who left shortly after mm. this um because i think they were really poised to do something incredible uh I mean, the album is good, but I think they could have done something really incredible yeah. after this. I mean, I really like Jeff Mann's solo stuff around this period as well, where he used a lot of the what guitar. he called wobbly guitar. Yeah. It was this sort of John Martin echo guitar and his very strident voice. Yeah. And it's a really original combination. It's not progressive. It's not standard singer-songwriter. You know, he was quite a unique talent, actually. So, yeah, I, like you, I've got a real soft spot for fact and fiction. And... <coughs> why it works is because it's all those things at once. Mm. It's new wave, post-punk, electro-pop, prog. Mm. And I think it's because they liked all of those things. I think so. I think it's a very natural... It's not. It doesn't seem like a self-conscious thing. Yeah. I think, if anything, the self-conscious aspect would have been to try and move themselves away from progressive rock, and as they were with Smiling and Grief. And as Marillion were emerging, they were kind of feeling a bit more emboldened to reclaim that part mm. of their personality and say, well, you know what? We can have this on the record too. Yeah. And I think that's what makes it so successful. Well, I remember them being on, they got on TV a couple of times. They did, they did the David Essex. Um, the David yeah. Essex, yeah. yeah. And I'm, sure, I'm not sure whether they did East of Eden or Eleanor Rigby. It was one of the two. I can't remember. But, but yeah, um, yeah. yeah, again, a very strident, punchy performance. Yeah. Let's move on to the, by far the bigger aspect of progressive rock this year which is the progressive rock bands that are embracing pop mm -hmm. 
to greater to greater or lesser degree and let's let's see if we agree on this let's start with rush okay. signals i love this album now apparently you were saying we had quite a lot of negativity because we dared to question whether was it power windows we were talking about it was power windows was entirely successful i still don't think it is entirely successful mm. i think it's a good record but i think the band get lost under layers of production on signals it's just right it's just right. This is the band that have made moving pictures. This is the band that have made permanent waves, embracing synthesizers, bringing it into the equation and completely pulling it off. Mm. And I think those are the three best Rush records. I, this run, permanent waves, moving pictures and signals. That run of three records, all very different, but mm. all increasingly embracing technology. Moving pictures, you would say, is probably the, the classic. Signals is right up there, isn't it? I think it's, it's great. I mean, I'd also record. put Grace Under Pressure in with that I don't run. Know I, that I one. really I like that one. Yeah. It's got more of a police U2 guitar okay. heavy sound. Um, yeah, Signals is great. I mean, Signals is a really um, powerful, original album in which they have reinvented their sound while remaining Rush. It's like we've just said about um, the Twelfth Night album. It is both a great synth pop, synth rock album. And a great progressive Rush album. They're not yeah. in any way running down their musicality. There's still some no. great time signatures in this, some great key changes, some amazing solos. This is as musical and progressive as anything they've done while totally embracing the zeitgeist. Yeah, I, I love this record. Um, I think also what, what makes this era of Rush so special is the lyrics, mm. Neil's lyrics. The, the early lyrics, for me, a little bit gauche, the, the sword and sorcery stuff, the, the Tolkien stuff, the sci-fi stuff, I can do without. But he hits, from permanent waves onwards, the, the mm. lyrics become more earthbound, they become more socially aware, all that, that sounds very dry and dull, but I don't mean it to. And you have songs on this, on this record, like Subdivisions, mm. um, The Analog Kid, yeah. just lyrically, and then something very simple, losing it. Beautiful, beautiful ballad. Yeah. I mean, Subdivisions and Losing It are two of my favourite yeah, all-time Rush pieces. Yeah. I think his reading had changed at that point. I mean, he was reading people like John Dos Passos, um, who he references, I think, on moving pictures. I think right. the camera eye is a John Dos Passos idea. And strangely, John Dos Passos is the inspiration for United States by Laurie Anderson as well. Oh, okay. Um, and he wrote the book, I believe, Manhattan Transfer. Love this album. So there you go, Cult of Rush members... 10 out of 10 for that album, okay? So Great album. Slag me off, okay. Jethro tells Broadsword and the Beast. There's, there's, there's a degree of them pulling off the same trick yeah. here with this album, isn't it? Um, sounds very much like Jethro Tull, but it's a Jethro Tull, a little bit more of a pop sheen. Yeah. Embracing synthesizers, but making it work. Making it work in a way that doesn't feel like a sellout. We'll come on to some other artists that maybe yeah. it does yeah, later. Well, I, I mean, I yeah. like Broadsword, and I think I like A. Some I mean, of I, Ian's best songs you know, as well. I like A. Me too. I really like Under Wraps, as is known. People hate the album. I love Under Wraps. But Broadsword pulls off being 100% Jethro Tull. It's a complex prog rock album in some ways. In some ways, yeah. But it's got an 80s sound. It's also got, more so than most Tull albums, in my view... Martin Barr is most metal. There's some real right. chugging riffs on this. So it's a great rock record, a great conceptual progressive record. And actually, it sits with lots of electro rock 1980s albums of a kind. But the songwriting is also a little bit leaner. Songwriting's good, A bit yeah. leaner, more, great more to the point. Great hooks. Great hooks. Good guitar hooks as well. It's great not ballads. just Ian Anderson. Slow marching yeah. band. What a beautiful, beautiful ballad. It's a really good album. I mean, I'm not... The, the only thing i'm not a fan of is the cover which i think plays to that slightly yeah. fantasy progressive You're imagery right, that yeah. people rather like hobbity isn't it yeah cover yeah but the album really good yeah great record we have to get the elephant out of the room here tim asia it was the heat of the moment what can you say about asia i can say that i was really anticipating this because obviously i loved yes really liked tlp really liked the buggles King and Crimson. i think the Buggles were getting great. King Crimson. I well, adore Jeff, King Crimson. We love Jeff. Jeff's, UK. We love Jeff. Jeff's been on some of our favourite albums. He's been, yeah. on, he's been on The Dreaming. Yep. He's been on The Buggles. He's yep. been on Yes's Drama, one of my favourite Yes I've albums. I've some backing vocals on one of his pieces. Jeff's on a roll here. What do we think about Asia? I think it's very good for what it is. 
this is, you know, it's, it was not what was expected given their pedigree. I think they work, is it with Mike Stone, the Journey producer on this? I don't know. So they've got a sort of, you know, top-notch FM rock producer. And to be fair, they pull it off. You know, Wetton's voice is great and strong. Heat of the moment, some of the other pieces. They're amazing pop singles for the time. It's just not my music, really. So I actually think they did what they did very well. Whereas you're right, you know, I really liked um, Buggles. I really like Yes. I really like all of them individually. How is one of the most individual, wonderful guitarists that Rock's ever had. Um, Wetton, what a bass player, what a voice. But this is a strong FM rock album that pulls off that trick. But It, it was massive. I said, it was. It was I sold think, by the bucket load. Not only in Britain, but in America. Japan, well, particularly in America. Yeah. And, and Japan. Japan, yeah. You know, this was huge. It was one of the albums of the year in terms of sales. Okay, I'm just going to put this out there, guys. I don't like it at all. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> Any more thoughts on that or not? I don't like it at all. Um, love Jeff, love Steve, love the band. Uh, all the band individually don't like it okay what were Genesis doing this year well Genesis released Three Sides Live Three Sides Live now uh, which is a, I think in America if I'm right in thinking was just a live album but in the UK it, it, it lived up to its title the set, the fourth side was some tracks that have been released as B-sides before yeah it, w one, can, one country had three sides live that were new and yeah. then a side live that was older material from right. late 70s recordings. I think yeah. Bruford might even be on one. I might be wrong there. Yeah. But I think there are older recordings on one side and then the other three, it's from the 81, 82 So the version tours. I listened to had a, 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 a studio side and there was some lovely evidence of autumn. Oh, amazing. They're B-sides from Dutch. So yeah. those are B-sides from, uh, from, from uh, the Duke album. Oh, that's probably what and I like. And they're amongst you. the lovely. best pieces they've yeah. ever done. Evidence of autumn. What Beautiful. a gorgeous piece of music. Amazing yeah. melody, lovely chord sequences. I mean, the thing is with Genesis, I, I still like them. I still like the We Can't Dance here even. And what is interesting, when we were talking about Gabriel 4, of course, Gabriel 4 is an innovative masterpiece. Abacab isn't. Duke isn't. But they're really good albums. I like them. Great yeah. pop albums, great progressive albums. And what I think they managed to do, as I've always said, even on Invisible Touch, which I think is a really good album, they knock off a few... Great pop songs, a few great pop ballads, but they're still doing Domino. They're still doing the Brazilian. They're still the same band that made Foxtrot. It's still in that DNA, the chord sequences, the rhythm shifts. I never bought into this idea that they were this big sellout. I think they love pop music and they made great pop songs, but I don't think they ever abandoned that quite complex instrumental aspect of their music in a way that Gabriel did. A couple of other entries were just briefly mentioned. Super Tramp, Famous Last Words. I like uh, that one. It's good. Got, it's raining again. I mean, it was always seen... It's a bit it was, more of the same. Yeah, and it was the album that kind of broke them because it didn't sell as well. I mean, it had the huge hit of It's Raining Again. Yeah. Because Breakfast in America, as we said, that's not only one of the biggest albums of the year. It's one of the biggest albums of all time. Yeah, and how do you follow that? Yeah. It, it remains, yeah. I think, in places like France, in the top three or four best right. sellers of all it's time. Brilliant. And it's, it's raining again, really good single. It's got more of a kind of introspective melancholy feel, this album, um, as if they kind of know they're coming to an end. Okay. But I like it. But I as like we said, we, we like the 1985 album. I do, I Brother Where You Bound. I yeah. like that. I, I like this album. I don't listen to it very often, but, but it, you know, it's certainly... It's the tramp, it, man. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't let the side down. It does not let the it's, side it's, down. It's quality. 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 How do you follow Breakfast in America? I mean, that, you know, that is... You, you want to follow, hide into nothing, You follow it you? with Tusk, too. Well, that's it. Either you do something completely different, as Fleetwood Mac did with Rue Mr. Tusk, or you do what Supertramp did, which is basically just make some Supertramp music. Well, like Pink Floyd were going to do with Dark Side of the Moon at one point, when they, the, was it the Found Sound or Found Objects? Ob household yeah. Objects, yeah. where they were making music with wine glasses, which eventually wound its way on to Shine On Your Crazy yeah. Diamond. But I love the idea that they were just going to do this album with household objects. Yeah, like completely, you know, just go off at a complete tangent. Yeah, yeah, that's what they should have done, maybe. Alan Parsons' project Eye in the Sky. This was this was like the commercial Huge. high watermark for yeah. for Alan, uh, Alan and Eric. It's good, isn't it? I mean, it's it's you know, yeah. Alan Parsons. I think have been developing for some time. You know, this kind of idea that you take the template of the Dark Side of the Moon and you make it a little bit more accessible, a little bit more radio friendly. 
And that's kind of what he's always done, isn't it, through records? But there's something about this record that maybe just a little bit cut above, or a couple of songs that just broke through I think to there's radio. A couple of songs. There's the instrumental that you know Serious. is used in yeah, yeah, that is used in sports games yeah. and sports commentary. And the to title this track, day. Title yeah, track, I think title became track massive, as well. didn't it? I think you're right. Yeah, I mean, I think they were really pretty consistent around this time. Maybe yeah. Eve is the one album that is perhaps not quite as strong as what surrounds right. it. But Agreed, yeah. yeah. But they're just making these great kind of pop prog crossover records. They have been pretty much from iRobot onwards. Yeah. And this is just the one that, for whatever reason, caught the zeitgeist, had the radio support, really broke through into the mainstream. Yeah, I mean, isn't, isn't it weird, though, that that's, you know, you've just, in effect, because it isn't a great deviation from the model, mm. but it hits, and it hits yes. in a big way. Yeah, yeah. Massive, massive record, yeah. Let's move on to singer-songwriters. Obviously not an era you necessarily think of as being a heyday for singer-songwriters no. in 1982, but we've got Tracy Thorne, uh -huh. her first album, Distant Short. Lovely record. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I you know, out of those early albums, I always like North Marine Drive, Ben Watt. Ben's album is, is, is the one for me, yeah, yeah. But it's a really charming album. Joni Mitchell's Wild Things Run Fast. Okay. Her first album of the 80s. Yeah. Her first album of original material since Don Juan. Now, I love Don Juan. Mm. And, I I, and I see so many Mingus people... Mingus has got original material. It's got original... It's mostly... Good lyrics. Band. Okay, and it's got some... Yeah, okay, you're right, but it's mostly Mingus mm. melodies, isn't it? I love Mingus. I do Yeah, it's too. Mingus melodies. It's her singing them. Yeah. Wild Things Run Fast. The first album of completely original material since Don Juan. I love Don Juan. I don't understand why it's so despised. It seems love to it. me. Wild Things Run Fast, on the other hand, seems to be quite lauded um and i'm not quite sure why this would be lauded and don juan's reckless daughter um damned except to say the wild things run fast seems like a less less complex it lyrically less complex musically less complex more approachable more slick what, what's your take on it i'm not saying it's bad at all yeah. it's just i'm i'm constantly i'm i'm constantly reminded there is this divide 70s 80s divide so the albums that were made just before the 80s kicked in and the albums that were made just mm -hmm. after the 80s kicked in neil young would be another great example his last album of the 70s russ never sleeps mm -hmm. is considered one of the greatest of his yeah, career yeah. the first albums he made in the early 80s reactor Hawks and Dove, as Hawks and Doves are often dismissed as garbage, and yet there isn't, to my ears, there isn't that much yeah. difference between them. And I think there's a similar thing going on here. In, it was in the opposite direction. Mm. Don Juan's Reckless Daughter, I think, is amazing. Yeah. Wild Things Run Fast, I think, is quite good. But Don Juan's Reckless Daughter always seems to get completely trashed, and this record seems to have a fairly good reputation. You're a big Joni fan, Tim. What's your take on this? Well, Don Juan is one of my favourites. You know, it's yeah. that. It's that Run, my two favourites, as I always say when I'm sort of asked for my favourite album of all time, you go famously with Zeit. I always go between Hijira and Hissing of Summer Lawns and I can never quite work out which. Mm. Hissing of Summer Lawns has got the diversity, Hijira has got the overall mm. arc and a, a more samey sounding palette throughout it. I love Don Juan, I love Mingus and I was disappointed with this at the time and it's still my least favourite Joni Mitchell oh, really? album okay. of all time I think oh, it's wow. one of the most produced the most it's, FM it sounds like Joni, Joni being overshadowed by session by musicians by A&R people me. Yeah. and session people and yet if you look and I did do my research sorry, sorry I did do my research on this if you look historically this album got great reviews is still considered very highly whereas Don Juan is a 2 out of 5 you know mm. even to this day dismissed as a 2 out of 5 um overarching, overreaching misstep. I prefer Chalk Mark in a Rainstorm, Dog yeah. Eat Dog. You know, this is my least favourite Joni album. It's got a couple of wondrous pieces. Chinese Cafe of course. is one of yeah. my favourite Joni Mitchell pieces and how it goes into Unchained Melody as well, which is a great tune. Joni would never produce junk, you know, don't get me wrong. No, but it's this a is a good album. It's just my, it's the one that I was yeah. disappointed by at the time and when I come yeah. back, I just don't like it that much, to be quite honest. And has, is this the one that's got Baby You're So Square, the Elvis Presley cover on uh, it as well? Could be, yeah. Which, it does that Steely Dan thing. That I know that Joni Mitchell comes, you know, she regards Chuck Berry and Elvis as amongst the greatest. And I can see this because their records are amazing. Their 50s records, 60s records are stunning. Uh, and I'd argue that Elvis still made some great albums in the 70s. But the thing is that Steely Dan always talked of 
beat poetry and bebop musicians while making this really smooth music. Yeah, you've talked about that before, yeah. And Jody does this rock and roll, you're so square. Yeah. And of course, the originals, the Elvis, it's raw, it's yeah. sexual, it's amazing. Yeah. This is like, you know, weather report fusion smoothness with trickiness. So you're doing it's like, it. You're so square. Well, yes, actually, you are. It's the yeah. antithesis yeah. of what it's loving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm not saying it's bad, you know, because of yeah. course it's not bad. It's Joni Mitchell, one of the greatest vocalists and lyricists of all time, and an amazing band of session musicians on it. Right. Yeah, I'm just I'm, not to my taste. I'm not a fan of this record. Bruce Springsteen's Nebraska. Now, we've talked about Bruce on the show before. I don't think either of us are, are you know, re ever really been able the to boss. buy into Bruce. Again, it's one of those artists, I know he's amazing. Yeah. I know he's amazing. I like his lyrics. I like his whole thing, his whole shtick. But he's not the boss of you, is he? I've never really warmed to his music. But if I had to pick one album yeah. to take to a desert island by Bruce, Nebraska would be the one. Now, famously, this was the album that he recorded on his home, on his home Porter studio. And then the engineer, I think he handed the cassettes to his engineer and said, clean that up, we're going to release this. Mm -hmm. And the engineer worked very hard to clean it up and make it sound good enough for release. What a bold thing to do. Yeah. What a bold thing to do for an artist. I mean, his previous records were, you know, massive, weren't they? Born to Run. And then what the record immediately, was it Darkness Before the Edge of, the Darkness on the Edge of Time? Yeah. Before this, The River. Massive, you know, globally multi-platinum selling albums. You deliver your next album. It's an album of just you and an acoustic guitar you've recorded on a Porter studio at home. Mm. What a bold thing to do, particularly in 1982. Yeah, no, it's a brave album that goes against the trends of the day, the sounds of the day. And, of course, it's the prelude to the Born in the USA yeah. to come, which is his high watermark commercially. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. It's one of my favourite boss albums. I mean, I've got some time for Born to Run. I actually rather like Me too. Me Born too. to Run. And, I do, uh, yes. You know, yeah. Jungle, Jungle Land, Land is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Meeting Across the River. And the title is track is amazing. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, so I really like that. Great artwork as well. That's one yeah. of those a bit like Fleetwood Mac rumours. The artwork, yeah. the music. It just collides into something quite special. Let's talk about Yandek or Jandek. I know nothing of him, so this is you. Have you never heard him? Did you heard listen? of him? Jandek is the original outsider. Um, this is this is an artist that Kurt Cobain said he's not pretentious, but only pretentious people say they like him, okay. which I love. I love that idea. He's made 120 albums since 1978. He's okay. very mysterious. For years, he wasn't interviewed. Uh, no one knew who he was. In fact, somebody conducted an interview in 1999, and by the end of the interview, they weren't sure they'd interviewed Yandek at all. Okay. They thought maybe they'd interviewed someone pretending to be Yandek. He made three albums this year. He's incredibly prolific. Chair Beside a Window, Living in a Moon So Blue, Staring at the Cellophane. I think you'd love it. Mm -hmm. Incredibly haunted lyrics and voice. And basically, at this point in his career, he can't play the guitar. He doesn't even know how to tune it. <laughs> so what he'll do is he'll just pick up the guitar... Mm -hmm. And every song on every album has the same open, completely out of tune. I like that, yeah. Open chord strumming over which he sings in this haunted voice, this kind of mutant folk blues. I don't know how else to describe it. I want to read you the lyrics to a track on the album, the first album that he came out with this year, Chair Beside a Window. We won't get into copyright problems. This is a Yandex, um, Yandex song called Down in the Mirror. You have to imagine this song in the most haunted moan way over this mm -hmm. discordant strumming. We can't deny there are spirits in this house. You shut the door, the wind closes two more. I laugh a dark laugh, you smile and think about it. You'll come again, I'm sure you can't refuse. Your spirit is here lying on a white table. I can see its gleam, it's sparkling in the sun. I wish I could leave the room and I lock the key. We'll let him, let him get the poet's license, we'll let him off with that one. Someday I would take hold of your hand and let it be. In the skyway, a shining path for you and me. Come back, oh please come back. I don't know what to do. Come back, oh please come back. Come back, oh please come back. And he'll string those lyrics out for about over a course of about 10 minutes. Okay. I think you would love it, Tim. But well, it's like an almost bit of Sid Barrett y there in the desolation. There, there is that. There is that song like Opal, maybe. There yeah. is that sense of desolation and mental illness. And when did he start? 
78, 79. And he's still going? He's still going. Just publishing albums on his who own. Released, yeah, I was about to say, who released Corwood, it? Corwood Industries. He releases who them distributes on his, it? I don't know, but he's a bit of a cult hero. Okay. He's a bit of a cult hero. He's done albums of like six LP box sets of him playing piano, just tinkling okay. on a piano. It's the ultimate outsider thing. Can he play piano? No. <laughs> okay. No. Um, so you're saying that I'm like John McLaughlin to him when it comes to guitar. That's what I mean. It's the outsider thing. Yeah. It's that I don't care that I can't play this instrument. I can't even tune this instrument. I don't even know what I'm supposed to do with this guitar. Dring! Dring! And What's then, his voice like? Can you imitate it? And I'm going to like this. There are spirits in this house. I don't know what come back to me, please. And it's not a figment of your imagination. You must have. You've heard of Yandek. I've heard the name Yandek. I've never bought one of his 3,000 albums. I'm going to send though. you. I'm going to send you. You just go on YouTube and listen to any song. Yandek. Every, every song. It's like one song ends and you think, okay, what's the next song going to be like? Exactly the same. And he's made exactly the, the same, same record tuning, since 1978. Same, no, every song he's got a different, the guitar's okay. out of tune in a different way. But then, he, then later on, he started. He started collaborate. Other musicians became fans, so they started okay. collaborating with him. But the first ten years, he's making about five albums a year, where he's just picking up his guitar. What's he look like? No one knows. No, they do now, actually. <laughs> no, but always the pictures would always be these grainy black and white pictures of him as a school kid, or yeah. like a family photo from when he was four. And the title, Rob, have you got some? You got some albums up there, right? Yeah, yeah. Show him that picture, Rob. There. Just show Tim that picture of Yandek there. Okay. There he is, look. I like him. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> come back to me. But no. there's something, do you know this? You know like the Lewis thing? Yes. It's got that intensity. It's like once you get over the fact yeah. that, it's, that it's shit, <laughs> it's yeah. brilliant. Okay. Do you know what I mean by that? I do, yeah. Lewis, obviously, another sort of classic outsider art, you know. Yeah, yeah. He can't, he can't sing. You can't hear a word he's singing. But it's, there's something about it that just gets under your skin and it's haunting. Okay. And the Yandek lyrics are... Can dark. you get it from our Amazon affiliate link? Yeah, I'm sure you can. You can certainly buy his records okay. on eBay. I'm going to send you a bunch of All records right. later. Um, I really like it. I really like it. It's not an artist I feel I need to own all 120 albums. Yeah. But I have about four or five albums and I feel that's enough. Do you know what I mean? Well, there are some artists like that, aren't there? I yeah. mean, you know, even bands that I love, you know, I love Jurity Column, but I don't feel a need to have every Jurity Column. You see, I've got about probably about 20 Jurity Column. I have, yeah. yeah. I mean, I say that <laughs> and certainly on my hard drive, I've got about 60 Jurity Column albums, <laughs> yeah. even though they only made about 20. But, but if you know. had to hone yeah. it down to the Desert Island disc, you'd be quite happy with just the... You'd be quite happy. I know what you mean, but then, can't, yeah, you say yeah. that, can't you say that about every, any artist? No. You're right. Okay. A lot of artists you can say that about. Possibly. Though, let's be fair, yeah. Um, I'll tell you, actually, can I just say one thing? I was doing an interview. It was an Italian magazine recently for my new album, Power Show, Drive. Showbiz Anecdote. Which is coming out. Showbiz, showbiz anecdote. anecdote. But they said something. Showbiz which, Anecdote coming up. Here which I thought was really quite interesting. Go on. And I misheard the question partly. And what I misheard the question as was this. So how would you feel if in 20 years' time there are two people like you and Stephen assessing your own work? And I thought, actually, I'd love it. Because I think 20 years' time, the two younger versions of us they'd love the fact that we'd done an album with two tracks then an album with 16 then did a disco symphony then decided to do an ambient or singer songwriter actually i think we'd quite like ourselves we might not like the music but we'd love the trajectory of the career well and i wonder how many people out there listening to this podcast now hate our music have no interest in it Never heard it, can't be bothered to listen to it. Well, here is, a, is another But just anecdote. like the show, I'm sure there's not, you Bra know. Bradford and Avon. Okay, where I am. Small town. Yeah. One person came up to me in the street going, you're Tim from the podcast, aren't you? I love it. So it's, you know, coming up. From the podcast. Not from No Man. Yeah. Not from solo work. Yeah. And then, the next day, and it was a different person, my partner and my son... There's a man walking with an album year's T-shirt. Wow. Talking about music is the new music. Well, you know, 
I'm sure there's lots of people that just tune in to hear our reviews of Yandek. <laughs> Come back to me. Come Let's move on, Tim. Let's talk about minimal jazz records. Always the last thing we cover, jazz, bless it. We've got a listener's review of Philip Glass, Glassworks. Let's hear the, the listener's review of Glassworks, please, Rob. Hi, Steve, and hi, Tim. My pick for 1982 is Glassworks by Philip Glass. This album was notable for introducing Philip Glass's style of minimalism in classical music to a wider audience of people. And I feel like it's significantly influenced modern classical music and film scores. So I think it's worth a mention for this year. I like this album a lot. I'd love to hear what you guys think about it as well. Thank you. I love it. I mean, it's, I think you've hit the nail on the head, really. This, this seemed to be a deliberate attempt to make Philip Glass's uh, approach and sound package it, package it in a slightly more accessible way. I think he'd done it once before with, with North, North Star, Star on Virgin. Yeah. But this is a second attempt to do that. I love it. The themes are beautiful. Yeah. They're quite succinct and by his standards. And it hangs together as hangs an together album. hangs together beautifully. Has um, a nice shape. I really it. like North Star. Yeah. I mean, North Star has got, you know, North Star is them trying to, in a sense, bring him in almost with that kind of New York, no wave, that scene mm. in some ways. And it works. North Star is a really strong album on Virgin. This is arguably even more successful because it comes across as a beautifully crafted album. It might be... In some ways, you know, what, what it is, a beginner's guide to Philip Glass, mm. but it really pulls it off because it's beautifully structured, lovely, haunting melodies. Yeah, I mean, that would be to, that would be to damn it with faint praise, wouldn't it? To say mm. it's like a, a, a packet accessible, but actually it's just as good as anything he did. And It is. And as you say, it has a beautiful shape to it as an album. And of course, being a classical composer, a lot of the pieces he wrote were not intended for vinyl release. And here's something where he's obviously sat down and conceived it as a vinyl release. Yes, in and a it rock sense. And it, and works it has funny. a lovely architecture. And it, it came out around, didn't kind of Scarzi come out around this sort of time as well, maybe slightly later. Maybe so, and yeah. it cemented him in the public mind, I think. You know, this was, uh, he's an artist I've seen live and he's very engaging, quite funny, quite charming. Mm. You know, he is as, in some ways, as funny and down to earth as the music is ethereal. Um, and um, I think the, the listener was also right when they say that this album kind of casts a shadow over a lot of modern neoclassical yeah. music, doesn't it? Uh, someone like Max Richter or Mills Fromm, so, yeah. Johan Johansson. Yeah. You can hear, Peter Broderick, you can hear the influence of something like Glassworks. Mm. Uh, simplicity, haunting quality, a, a, a something that I think very much lends itself to use with imagery. You, t you talked about Coinus Cutsy being around the same time. Philip Glass's music was just made, wasn't mm. it, for, for, for image and for to being used well, in Well, it, it was a bit like music for films or film music, as you like to call it, by Brian Eno, that it was almost like a calling card to directors. Right. I think, don't you? Yes, although works. probably in this case, probably un, you know unwittingly. Yeah. So yeah, but obviously his music's been picked up time and time again for for. And for it film. works. I mean, the thing Just is, the, it, yeah. it does lend that aura of class almost to anything. Yeah. I mean, I would love to hear some Philip Glass music on old Benny Hill footage. You know, I think it, it would elevate it. I think it would. Yeah. The Philip Philip Glass. It's 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 incredibly um, repetitive. Mm. And it should be irritating, and maybe it is to some people, but it isn't. It's incredibly um, lyrical and beautiful at the same time. Some mm. of his early works, perhaps slightly more austere, more academic, yeah. but in, in an album like Glassworks, there's that perfect balance between the beauty and the accessibility and what Philip Glass does, yeah. which is these repeating ostinato figures. You know, um, what a trick to pull off. Mm. And as you say, massively influential. Not only on on you know modern neoclassical, just influential period, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, we, and as is this next artist we're going to talk about, we never really figured out if it's Steve Reich or Steve Reich, but whatever it is, we hear his influence everywhere, don't mm. we? These days, and his record, I know this is one of your favourites, Tim, to heal him. Yeah, from this year, which I think is a setting of an old Hebrew. It is. Text, it is. It? Um, it was the first piece I ever heard and ever bought, and I heard it probably about a year after it was released. And it was our old No Man guitarist, the Still Owl, who introduced it to me. Right. And, um, yeah, it was unlike anything I'd heard at that point. Oh, I could recognise I'd heard bits in, say, Peter Gabriel, you know, No Self-Control, 
Um, so there were elements, and and I think um, Mike Oldfield's incantations. You could hear he had elements mm. of Steve Reich, Philip Glass. So there were certain elements of things that I'd liked previously. I thought, ah, that's where they're getting it from. Mm. Hypnotic, moving. It does what he does, which is it's spellbinding. Because on one level, you have this frantic music which is in constant motion yet equally it seems motionless wonderful trick to pull off and he always shifts gear just at the point you think you might get bored because it is constantly shifting it's cogs wheels within wheels it's i think the difference between philip glass and steve reich obviously is that philip glass has the whole band play the same notes through the mm -hmm. ostinato where steve reich or reich is more interested in the, the polyphony that occurs when you allow things to cross yeah. and to phase in and out. And of course, his very early pieces were, were much more academic in the sense they were mm. pure pieces experimenting like with tape loops going in and out of phase. Yeah. But you hear that also in his later works, this fascination with different rhythmic figures being mm. allowed to cross and to cycle back on themselves. In, in a sense, he's always stayed true to his early methodology, but... He'll have a few albums that almost kind of toe the line, tread the line, and then there'll be a breakthrough. Well, I don't know whether Tehillim's a breakthrough, but I love it. I think it's fair to say Tehillim would have been one of the albums that would have made his name because mm. it's a sort of album that would have been picked up. It came out on ECM, yeah. known as a, still known then primarily as a jazz label. It would have been picked up, it would have been probably much better distributed than anything he'd done before. This and Music for 18 Musicians, mm. I suspect a lot of people just picked up out of curiosity. I know, for example, there's a story about um, Mike Scott from Waterboys mm -hmm. being in New York around the time he was making This Is The Sea and just picking up to heal him okay. and taking it home and having his mind blown. You know, yeah. and, and not, again, not a musician you necessarily think of as someone that would have been influenced by, mm. by Reich or Reich, but there you go. There's another example. Well, it has, I think, you know, the similarity is, you know, I mean, we both love This Is The Sea by The Water Boys. Yeah. And there's that euphoric, relentless, yeah. euphoric repetition. quality. Yeah. And the fact that it's repetition, but actually no one bar is the same. Yeah. The way in which he phrases the vocals, the rhythm of the guitar. Yeah. There's something always slightly shifting, even though essentially it's the same chord sequence, the same pulse and rhythm. Yeah. A couple of records that were jazz records on ECM this year. Pat Metheny Group's Off Ramp. Good one. And Eberhard Weber's Later That Evening. Both. Yeah, really records. lovely, yeah. Two of my favourites by, by both of us. I mean, we, we've, we've kind of got to this point before on the episodes where what do you say about ECM jazz? Yeah. They're instrumental. They're lovely records. Uh, <laughs> these are two of the best records by these two particular artists. Yeah. If you're a fan of Pat Metheny's guitar, so he's using a lot of the, the Roland synth guitar on this album. Are You Going With Me is, is mm. the classic you know, in some ways, the archetypal Pat Metheny track, isn't it, mm. on this record? Eberhard Weber, if you like his bass sound, you, you'll you have heard it also. Is he on the Dreaming Eberhard Weber? Or is he not? He's not on a okay I record? I think he might be. He's definitely on Hounds of Love. Yeah. And I think he is on the Dreaming part. And he's all over Sensual World. Anyway, you'll know, yeah. if you're a Kate Bush fan, you'll know the sound of I Eberhard might not. Weber's bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the interesting thing with that is, and they're both equally great ECM albums. Probably the last time I kind of loved the label and mm. loved the releases on it. But what is interesting is Pat Metheny is about to go stellar, you know, obviously yeah. collaborating with Bowie, doing film soundtracks mm. and becoming this spokesperson for um, ever-evolving contemporary jazz, whereas Weber remains in the shadows really until his stroke. Um, and again, one of the best live bass players I've ever seen. And once more, like Philip Glass, surprisingly funny and humble when he played live. And it's amazing how many records he's on when you go yeah. back. and you, a, a lot of records in the early 70s, Scandinavian jazz records. He just pops up. Played with George player. Russell as well, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, absolutely. Might be one of my favourite, if not my favourite bass player, actually. I love yeah, him. Yeah, uh, amazing, yeah. Weather Report and made an eponymous record this year. I yeah. thought Weather Report made an eponymous record in 1971 They did, well. they made two eponymous records so this is a second eponymous yeah. record um i don't know it i do know it okay is it um what i think it is 80s jazz yeah. fusion with terrible keyboard sounds <laughs> <laughs> i don't mind it as much as you okay. i know this i haven't heard it so i can't say i, I quite it. like their yeah. sort of spindly early 80s albums you know domino theory being another one um so i quite like it Okay, we'll leave it at that. 
And that's it, Tim. 1982 in a nutshell. Well, in a in a nutshell that we've been talking for about five a five hour long nutshell. Yeah. Okay, so fascinating year. I know mm. we say that every time, but it it really is true. It is a fascinating year. Some amazing records. How are you going to pick one to take to your desert island, Tim? Oh, no, we're not becoming good, yeah. we're not becoming desert island discs. Let's forget the desert island thing. You have to pick one album. No, you're allowed to pick more than one album, obviously. But maybe you want to first pick the album you feel has been the most influential in the long term. Well, funnily enough, I'm going to go with Glassworks, actually, because you still hear its yes. influence on film music to this day. Yes. I'm going to go with the same. I'm going to be lazy. I'm going to go with the same record as the record of my year, record of the year. And I think the record's been the most influential in the long term. I'm going to go with The Dreaming. Mm hmm. I think it is my favourite record of the year. It's the yeah. one that I'm still in awe of. I may not enjoy it every time I listen to it as much as every other time, if you know what I mean by that. I have to be in the right mood for it. But I just think it's on another planet. Mm -hmm. I'm in awe of it. But I think it's not influential in, in a musical sense, but it's influential in the sense you have to remember this time in history, women artists were not in a position, generally speaking, to be empowered to make records like this. And she was the anomaly at the time. Someone who apparently was in complete creative control of what they were doing. Mm. And we now live in a world where women dominate the modern pop landscape, completely dominate it, almost to the complete exclusion of male artists. And I think in that sense, Kate being one of the only ones at the time, one of the only female artists at the time that had that degree of control over her music and to create something so experimental Kate takes it to a whole other level. Um, and for me, that's why this is such an influential record. People still talk about Kate Bush. Mm. Even after all these years, people still talk about Kate Bush as being this incredible icon, for particularly for female artists. I mean, when do you not read a review of a quirky female song or song, mm -hmm. singer songwriter that doesn't name check Kate Bush? Hardly ever happens, does it? Mm. Um, and I think you have to look at the tradition that she started and you'd have other artists that came along like Bjork, for example, very mm. much in that tradition. But now we have a lot of empowered female artists, that some of which are dominating the pop mm. landscape. And I think she, to some extent, begins that in a modern, co certainly in a mm. modern context. I think I'd go for five albums for this. The Dreaming has got to be there. It's a favourite. To say it's not a favourite will be entirely wrong. Associate Sulk. I think both of those have got an otherworldly, demented quality. And I can see that Björk's listened to both of those albums. I then think Gabriel Four, And then for me, um, All the Best Cowboys. Yeah. And The Golden Age of Wireless, actually, yeah. were just albums that meant a lot to me. OK, well, if you've, you've just had about eight there. Five. OK, what were they again? The Dreaming. Agreed. Sulk. Four. Love Sulk. Agreed, Four. All the best cowboys. Greed. Golden Age of Warriors. Golden Age. Okay, I'm, I'm going to allow myself one more then. Go on. I'm not going to, I love Sulk, but I'm not going to put it in my top five. Just give me a moment to look through this. <laughs> Another one. I'm going to have my fifth one because you've had five. So yeah. there. Um, what Yandek. Be <laughs> <laughs> I love Love Over Gold. Por probably Pornography. Okay. I think I'm going to with Pornography as my I Love Sex Tech by ACR. I'm, I think I'm going to go with Pornography as my as my fifth album. But otherwise, okay. well, four out of five we agree on, Tim. There you go. Not bad. Not bad at and all. And actually, Glassworks, now we're talking about it. Philip Glass Glassworks. An album I've played an awful lot and love. I like Signals as well. Great album. Signals, what a great album. Yeah. Okay. 1982, folks. There it is in a nutshell. We're going to call it a day there. Thank you very much for listening, for watching. Um, what do we have to say, Tim? If you like the podcast... Oh, yeah. Press like. And I think Stephen's developed a tip jar, haven't you? We're not doing the tip jar thing. That is so naff. Sorry. That's so naff. We're not doing the tip jar. But yeah, give us a good but, review. But we do have, we do have um, a book coming out on our theory of music. Do we? No. That's the first I've heard of it. <laughs> we should do one. We should. We should, do, we should do a book of yeah. the classic. We, we could do a chapter on Queen's Hot Space. Yeah. A chapter on Sunset Wading. A chapter on... Virginia Astley. Okay, thank you very much, folks, for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.